If you can't fix it, you cut it off. Gallbladder, cut it out. Hernia, take it out. Leg, can't fix it, cut it off. Metabolism biochemistry is never a straight line. It is a complicated web of interaction. Well, viruses, I say, are people too. What are they like? They like sugar. As you said, you take pieces of the puzzles and you put it together. And no matter how long it takes, 15 years, 25 years, you change your views based on the new data. But a lot of scientists these days, because of their ego, if anything, and the years of work, they are going to live and die on that hill. They are not willing to change their views if they think one thing is causing this disease, that's it. That's the end of the day. No matter what new data comes out, they are not going to budge. All 8 billion of us are doing metabolism at all times. This show is about learning what metabolism is, how it affects you in every way possible, from mood and mental state to performance and energy. We are all about fine-tuning the human experience for you to achieve the best self you can be. And if you are someone who loves science, curious to know how your body works and how to optimize it, then you are in the right place. This is the HVMN Podcast. All right, we have Dr. Rick Jacoby. Thank you very much for coming on to the Health via Modern Nutrition Podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. We had a little trouble yesterday, but I think we got it together today. Yes, thank you very much. We had some technical difficulties yesterday and thank you for being so flexible and I can't wait to pick your brain around so many topics that are very, very popular amongst our audience around metabolic health, inflammation, neuropathy, you know, diabetes. It's always being discussed on here and it's always very interesting to get the different perspective from the different experts here. Yes, and I have a very unique approach to this, and that's because I'm basically trained as a surgeon. So most people <clears throat> probably ha you've had on your show are uh, PhDs or, or medical doctors who are not surgically trained. So my background goes way back. I don't know how far you want to go back. That, that's great. You know what? We all love a story. Tell us, you know, how far, no matter how far back you go, you know, tell us your whole story, where you started, how you get to where you are today. Well, it's, it's a long story. Uh, started back in Philadelphia. Um, I was, when I graduated from college, really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, but I was interested in going to podiatric medical school, which I did. But the, in the interim, I went to Vill Villanova for chemistry. So podiatric is to do with feet? Uh, just um, graduate work in chemistry, really kind of to find out what I wanted to do. So I got accepted in Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania College of Podiatric Medicine. And I was fortunate in those days, I was um, assigned to a laboratory because we worked when we went to school in those days. I don't know if that's still true. You just take out government loans, but we didn't. And I was assigned to the Ben Franklin Clinic in Philadelphia, and it was Dr. Um, Chef. He was a PhD MD out of uh, London. He worked with Watson and Crick, and he taught uh, biochemistry in Philadelphia. So I was his research assistant. So I would like to say I was one, once removed from Watson and Crick. <laughs> yep. And, and, and for those, those who do not know who Watson and Crick are... Yeah, the, you know, the discoverer of DNA. And that was a new subject for me. Uh, Dr. Sheff, and he was working on PKU, which is uh, phenylketonuria, birth defect of the basal ganglia in the brain. And believe it or not, we used to do the experiments uh, on a bench. That's, this is all electronic done now. But we, or I did the experiments at his behest. I fed the rats. I rendered the rats. I prepared their brains, I fed them different chows. And basically, he was looking at PKU in those days as a metabolic disease, which it really is. So it's what you eat. And I didn't fully understand that at, at that time. I was in his biochemistry course, and I just want to make sure I got through that, you know, how difficult that stuff is. And um, I was in his class, so I did very well. So he, got, he gave me the bug. I graduated. I did my residency in surgery in Philadelphia in podiatric medicine, went to, uh, directly out to um, Phoenix area, settled in Scottsdale. 
Uh, I did general podiatric surgery for many years. I was fortunate. I, I started the wound care center at Scottsdale Hospital maybe 35 years ago. So I had a lot of experience with amputations, diabetic neuropathy, um, metabolic syndrome, because that's what it was called back then, syndrome X, actually. And then I ran into Dr. Lee Dellen, and he was giving a lecture on surgical decompression of nerves of the lower extremity. So you, we talked about Dr. Dellen. Who is he? What does he do? Where is he from? Well, he's an amazing human being. He's at Johns Hopkins. He was originally trained as a plastic surgeon, and in his day, plastic surgeons did the hand surgery. That was not a subspecialty in the 70s and 80s. That became a subspecialty. So if you had a carpal tunnel, which was very rare back then, you would send it to a plastic surgeon. Eventually, they become they become a subspecialty in themselves. And he had a patient in the 80s who had he had done a carpal tunnel release and a uh, ulnar tunnel release at the elbow. And she said to him, and Dr. Dellon, I'm a diabetic. Why don't you fix my diabetic neuropathy? He said, well, that's a different disease. And he thought about it. He went to the laboratory, did amazing experiments, if your, your audience likes that sort of thing. Rats put ink in their paws, ran them across paper, decompressed one foot not, or paw and the other paw, put bands around the nerves, silicone bands, to create this effect of compression. So he came to the conclusion that the tunnels in the hand, seems obvious today, but it wasn't then, that the homologous uh, structures of the leg are the same as the hand. Now, I mean, that that's just makes sense. Uh, so he found those tunnels, decompressed the lady who had the ulnar tunnel and carpal tunnel, and she re had her sensation restored published his first paper in 1984. Now here we are, what, I mean, 40 years later, and it's still not a popular procedure. But he taught me in about year 2000, and I thought it was a novel procedure. He said, read my textbook, by the way. He's written two textbooks, probably 800 peer-reviewed articles, um, prolific writer, nice guy, brilliant as they all are, and um, he can't get anybody to understand what he's saying. So I read his textbook, went down to Johns Hopkins, I trained with him in peripheral nerve surgery, the lower extremity, came back, I had my first patient, I said, let's call her Janet, Janet, I said, I have a new procedure, it's the first one I'm going to do in a live patient, uh, would you like to do it? Your twin sister actually had just passed away from diabetes, and she was in a wheelchair, and she had multiple amputations. She still had her extremity, but multiple amputations, some of which I did. And I said, I, I don't know what else to do for you, Janet. And she said, let's do it. So I did it. So this is in spite of amputation? Yes, yes. She had Instead of amputation, you are choosing this other procedure that you're going to tell us about. It's very similar to the carpal tunnel. So she had no feeling. And um, she should have had an amputation, but she was willing to try this, so I did. And she actually did get her feeling back, but I lost her to follow up. And about three months later, she came back in the clinic, and she was walking. Wow. She had been in a wheelchair, and she had a sling on her arm. And I'm like, what's going on here? You weren't walking. You're in a wheelchair. Now you're walking, but you have this sling on your arm. What happened, Janet? She said, well, my, I couldn't walk. My husband took me to, to Hawaii, and we were climbing on the lava rocks. I slipped, I fell, and I broke my arm. I want to thank you. That's how it all started. Wow. Yes, that's what I said. I, this is amazing. Why does that work? How does it work? Now, I, I kind of had an idea how it worked from Dallin's teaching, so I was all in at that point. So... I've done thousands of those procedures. We don't have any amputations. But the, the, right now, there's a million and a half amputations a year in the world, and about 100,000 in the United States, 150,000 in the U.S. But why does it work? Well, it's so simple when you think about it. It's back to sugar. Sugar is a chemical. And glucose, in spe 
in particular, and I'll explain the difference between glucose and fructose and all the other sugars, but glucose is the killer. So sugar, glucose, is, uh, had, goes through the Maillard reaction is number one. So in a sugar plus a protein, for you biochemists out there, you'll love this. So when you mix them, they cause a chemical reaction, goes through a shift base, where it's reversible, and then when it goes on, it causes these soft tissue, the collagen, the proteins, to shrink. So think of a nerve inside a shrink wrap. So that's shrinking. The second pathway is the polyol pathway, where sugar gets inside the nerve, goes through enzyme system, aldose reductase inhibitors, it overloads the system, and it breaks down to sorbitol, which is hydrophilic, meaning when it brings water into the nerve. So that if a nerve is swelling and the covering is shrinking, Dr. Dellen says that's compression. And he's absolutely correct. So I work with him, and then I, one day, I don't know why I said this, I said, Dr. Dellen, I think there's more to your theory, so why don't you figure it out? Now, he's written like 800 papers, right? And I said, well, I will kind of go outside my field. I found a guy up at Stanford, John Cook. He's a cardiologist by training, and we'll talk about cardiology disease and, and heart, and he has a PhD in vascular biology. He studies one molecule, asymmetric dimethyl arginine, and I'll explain that in a minute. And he had written an article in circulation in the year 2004, it's called the Uber marker, if you want to look it up, John Cook with an E. And um, so I read the article and I went, wow, this is interesting. The biology uh, behind the vasculature of, I think it might apply to the nerve. So I text him. He calls me on the phone like two hours later. Love your idea. Come up to Stanford. Let's work on that. I did. So long story short, um, I took my patients, maybe 160 patients, and measured his molecule against my patient population. I found all these other nerves, including MS, that had elevated ADMA, we'll call asymmetric dimethyl arginine, ADMA. And let me explain what that word means, but asymmetric dimethyl arginine. I mean, it's arginine, amino acid, two methyl groups, they're on one side. Asymmetric dimethyl arginine. You know how biochemistry is. There you there go. We go. Yeah. Let's make it simple. Well, what was that molecule doing? It was blocking the nitric oxide pathway. And why that is a really an important concept, this is back in 2005, Nobel Prize in Medicine was just given to uh, Murad and his group for discovering nitric oxide. So this is kind of all new, and Dallin's papers, most of them were written before that was known. So we had those two chemical pathways. So I theorized that ADMA was the first molecule that blocked the autonomic nervous system. The other two block uh, actually a large fiber versus small fiber. I don't know if your audience, you want me to go deeper into that, but that was a big question back at that in 2004 and five, because most people thought small fiber, which means, let me go back in the history of how this was discovered, which makes it so difficult. So. They were called A-delta fibers, C-fibers, blah, blah, blah. And, of course, they were being discovered at different times. But if we did metric system, it would mean the very smallest to the very largest. You would have measured in millimeters, but that's not what's, how it's done. But when it makes sense, the more work a nerve does, like in computer field, the more insulation you need. So you need more insulation, bigger wire. If it's very, very small, like hot and cold, and it goes through the skin, the nerves, they're called C fibers, they're non myelinated because they don't need any covering because there's sensories all over the body for hot and cold, light touch, things like that, and in the autonomic nervous system. And then when you get more myelin, more work, more electricity going through the nerve, that's sensory, pain. And then when you get the largest nerves, that's motor. Like if you want to move your arm, it takes a lot of energy, signal. So that's the basic. But that was not known back then when I was looking at this. So I theorized that ADMA was interrupting the autonomic nervous system. And there weren't any papers. And Dr. Cook said, well, 
no one's figured this out. Quit your practice, work with me at Stanford. And my kids are like 10 years old. I'm a clinician, I'm not a scientist. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, um, I'll write a book and that's Sugar Crush. It's, it's gonna take 15 years to figure all this out. You know how science goes, very slow. Although I did like rats, still like rats. They're, I mean, when, when you're doing research, you do really become bonded to these little guys. And it has been discovered. So I talked to Dr. Cook. He's now at Baylor for stem cell research. And we'll kind of segue into the stem cell portion of this. And, um, and he said, well, you were right. And I said, I was right in two points. I told you it would take 15 years. And it did. And, uh, and it is the first blocker of the nitric oxide pathway. So what does nitric oxide do? It relaxes the endothelium. It comes through the endothelium and it relaxes the muscle around the nerve and the vasovasorum, which means the blood supply to the nerve. So now we have the mechanism of action for the first phase of diabetic neuropathy and I think for every other nerve in the body, but that, that work still has to be done. So I started to have uh, cognition. I said, wait a minute, these people who are coming into me and I'm saying, are you diabetic? And they said, no, I did my blood test. And I had a nerve conduction test or an EMG. Nope, I am not. Well, they're measuring large fiber neuropathy and these people have pain. So it's really small fiber. And that debate back in that day, 2004 or five, they were separate and distinct diseases, small fiber versus large fiber. They're not, they're a continuum, which just makes sense. And the cause of aging is sugar, glucose. But these people are not diabetic. Well, they say they're not. Now that's a good question, okay? Yeah, because, because you may have that sort of neuropathy and you may have some form of metabolic dysfunction from a glucose point of view, but it may not be clinically significant enough to be classified and diagnosed as di diabetic. Oh, absolutely. Great question. Now, here's why clinically significant. Boy, that's a good one. So let's go back to the 1800s. I wasn't there, but I did read the papers. <laughs> well, as a funny segue at the Pennsylvania Hospital where I did a lot of my surgery when I was in my residency. And that was the first hospital in the United States. Still there, beautiful place. I used to eat, eat lunch in Ben Franklin's library almost every day because it was quiet. No one ever went in there. It's still there. So I think I kind of was channeling through him. But the, the hospital is just gorgeous. And back then, when it was built in 1751, bloodletting was the treatment of choice. And it's amazing how the evolution of medicine, but the terminology, that's really the key. So people were discovering things. Oh, what's this thing? Well, it's a C fiber. It doesn't have any myelin on it. So it's called, I don't know why they call it a C. Um, somebody like Charcot, 1800s, he comes along and says, a patient who had um, migraines, he treated a lot of migraines, and he observed those things. Thomas Wills, the first the first neurologist in the world in the 1600s, they were naming these things. So MS, Charcot, 1860s, what's that mean? Multiple sclerosis, multiple white spots in your brain and your spinal cord. Well, to me, that's not a disease, that's an observation of a process. So all these diseases, MS being one, Alzheimer's, early 1900s, he said, wow, what's wrong with this guy? He's lost his uh, memory. Autopsy goes in, he sees these plaques and tangles in the brain. Well, that's not a disease, that's a process, an effect, like an accident, car accident out of the corner. We don't name it um, the intersection of where the car accident was. They're all the same mechanism. But these diseases are where the tissues had the accident, let's say. So MS is the, the vagus nerve, uh, Alzheimer's actually is a uh, olfactory nerve, uh, sense of smell, and the hippocampus in the brain where there's information is st as stored. So you have, the, let's just talk about Alzheimer's in that sense. So we have a nerve, we have sugar. I just described the pathology and the process and the, and the uh, ke chemistry of that. Well, let's apply it to this nerve. This is what I did in the book, Sugar Crush. 
because I, I saw all that stuff when I did those tests. So what's the first symptom of Alzheimer's? Loss of smell, olfactory nerve. Just like small fiber neuropathy, I got this little zingers. We, by the way, the word for that zingers is um, called formication. I love that word. It's spelled with an M. You have to purse your lips when you say that one. So that came from the, the Latin word formic acid, ants biting. I see. That's where it, I had to look it up because I was like, what is this word? <laughs> so when you get these little zingers, as I call it with my patients, that's what's happening. Little tiny axons are dying back, and you feel it. And some people call that fibromyalgia because it's all over the place with the C fibers. But that's the first phase. So somebody came along and said, if you have more than seven areas of pain, then therefore it's fibromyalgia. Well, that's a descriptive term, just like MS. And that's how nomenclature of, of uh, medicine was established. And that's what the test questions are about. And the more you know, the brighter you are, apparently. So we get into all these crazy diseases like uh, Ramsey Hunt disease, which, uh, which just was in the news. And Ramsey Hunt disease that um, um, cheeseburger in paradise guy, um, um, Jimmy Buffett, he's, he had that disease. I had to look that up. And I was like, wait a minute. I mean, what is that? That is, that is a branch of the facial nerve. And it gets a name. So you think it's a different disease. Well, it's not a different disease. It's a different location of the same process. Um, so a lot of, like, what's current right now, like Alzheimer's, now we're calling it frontal lobe dementia, like that separate well, a separate spot of the same process. Yes, go ahead. So, so to simplify and to summarize what, what you've just told us is essentially sugar causing neuropathy and a lot of these diseases through sort of asymmetric um, dimethyl arginine um, and other biomarkers that essentially compress and restrict these different neuron uh, n nervous fibers that cause that that then manifest into neuropathy am, am i correct yes and absolutely and let's let's define the word neuropathy neuropathy a very general term so neuropathy means a problem with a nerve. Question is, what's the problem? So we look from a, yeah. you use the word clinical manifestation, that's the symptoms. And then we go and find where that symptom, where, like this headphone I had problems with yesterday. Well, if it's not plugged in or there's a kink in it and it's, it's connected to your sound system, it doesn't work. Is that a separate disease? No, it's a separate place. And anyway, medicine evolved differently than mechanical engineering. And that's a big difference. So our learning system is, is very uh, memorization oriented. And it's a, just a massive amount of information. And when you're being taught, they don't care what you think. Here's, here's the data regurgitated. So there's never a chance to think until you get out and practice. And then you start to think, what the heck am I doing here? Amputating legs, for instance. Well, it works. Yeah. You know, I say to my patients, it works. You know, I used to run a headache clinic. It works for that too. <laughs> if you cut the head off, there's no more symptoms. <laughs> the leg, you know. So that's what medicine is, is and I say itises and ectomies. Inflammation, and we'll talk about acute and chronic, and ectomies. If you can't yes. fix it, you cut it off. Gallbladder, cut it out. Hernia, uh, take it out. Leg, can't fix it, cut it off. That's, that's how medicine evolved and surgery. Let's go back to the medical portion of this. So in medicine, we're trying to modulate infl inflammation, and two, acute and chronic. Well, medicine grew up on acute inflammation. You fell off your horse, you broke your leg, that's acute inflammation. You put some screws and plates in there, put them in a cast, and that inflammation, which is dramatic, 
and sudden, and the inflammatory response is dolar, tumor, uh, those are the s signs of inflammation, acute. But w the bulk of the medicine, medical problems in the Western world is due to diet, and that diet is sugar, and it causes chronic inflammation, which we can measure. One of the measuring devices uh, is the sugar, glucose, but that's at the end. It's, if it's elevated, it's, the damage is already done. ADMA may be a, it is a better marker, by the way. It's three to one more specific than C uh, CRP, which is the measuring device in the blood for inflammation, but it's not really used that much, even though I learned this 20 years ago from Dr. Dellen. And just a segue on the COVID epidemic, that should have, and it was measured, and there were a couple of papers, and I looked it up, in a Korean nursing home, they could predict death with that because the inflammation. And in COVID, Elevated ADMA levels were 97% predictor of death. If you had high levels of ADMA, you're, you're going to die. So on page 25 of my book, Sugar Crush, I, I discussed that. And that book came out in 2015. I wasn't thinking of viruses at the time, but here's what, what it means. Well, viruses, I say, are people too. What are they like? They like sugar. If you don't give them the right amount of sugar in their in their uh, beakers, they die. It's very difficult to keep a virus alive. So they're looking for sugar, like everybody else. They get in your lungs. If you're a diabetic and at our hospital in Scottsdale, probably 95% of the people who are admitted to the uh, intensive care were diabetic because they had high levels yeah. of sugar. They were already inflamed. Virus gets into the lungs, looks around. They want to raise their family. <laughs> they want some. They want some food. There they are. They got a perfect host. Yeah. So what I was gonna say is that while I appreciate that you know ADMA levels are you know a great predictor of death when you have COVID, I think it's important for us to also acknowledge that these biomarkers, these infl inflammatory biomarkers, is a great predictor contextually. So you need to have COVID and then seeing that biomarker being elevated and therefore having that predicting capacity, right? Because the reason why I say that is that CRP, for example, it goes up and down very easily. Even if you exercise, you can see that level goes up, right? And it needs to be understood because a lot of people, when they hear this on social media, on podcasts, they're like, oh my God, you know, one marker goes up, I should be scared. It's not so much that. It's, it's very contextual. Um, it is dependent on the activity that you're doing, your current health state, and in what other confounding factors are there to be present in order for you to really interpret the elevation of that biomarker being dangerous or not. Right. That's Would you a, agree to that? Very, very well framed. Uh, so this, it, it, there's other markers. There's a clinical exam. There's now, this is not my field. I, I don't treat COVID patients, but I do see right. the COVID. But it's just interesting. I had talked about it, not thinking of that. But what is the hallmark finding with COVID people in the intensive care unit? Their O2 levels are going down. That's how yep. they die. They can't exchange oxygen. Right. So here in the United States, we put a ventilator on them. Mm -hmm. They can expand and contract their lungs. They can't exchange oxygen. If they measured their ADMA level, which a lot of studies did, it was extremely high, 97%. The higher, the higher your ADMA levels, the less you can exchange oxygen, and you die. What yeah. are the, what's the antidote? L-arginine is a very simple amino acid that increases the conversion of uh, L-arginine to nitric oxide. But there are a lot of other cofactors. So since we're in the intensive care unit, as you put us there for a second, you're right. There, it's not just your ADMA is elevated and we act. No, there's, you have to look at everything. Would you then connect the increase in ADMA and the decreases, ni decrease in nitrous oxide inhibit the vasodilation of blood vessels and nerves um, 
therefore creating the inability of the lung to expand and take in oxygen. Do you think that's the link? Totally. I've also read um, papers around cytokine storm, that, which is also, again, an you know, inflammatory uh, response to this disease that is causing that. So now we know from a mechanism of action point of view, m molecular science point of view, why that is. So this is super interesting. Isn't it interesting? I mean, I learned that in 2005 from Dr. Cook. That's a long time ago. So, yes, cyto cytokine storm. So what, what does that really mean? So the virus gets into your lung, or let's say gets in anything, but we're talking about the lung at, at the moment. Well, what's the defense mechanism? Is white cells, okay? So that's a foreign invader. So they come down to the cell, and say, what's going on here, guys? And he said, well, there's, we got a foreign body in here. Well, we're going to get in a fight. We're going to throw you out of here. And they're going to say, no, you don't. And that cell becomes the staging ground for trauma. And the O2 levels start to go down. And that's how you die. So unfortunately or fortunately, biochemistry never is a straight line. It's not linear. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that because I say that all the time. Metabolism, biochemistry is never a straight line. It is a complicated web of interaction that is all interdependent to each other. Well, let, let's just talk about that. I was, I talk about Otto Warburg in the book and in the, in the, his cancers research. It's sugar and specifically fructose. But I, and, I don't think, how did these people understand that? We have computers to help us understand these things, but they did everything in their brain. And Otto Warburg is really the guy that was that started that whole thing in Vienna in the uh, early 1900s. And Krebs was his student. Did you know that? Uh, I did not know yeah. that. Yeah, no. so, and, 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 and Meyerhoff was the other guy. So they're the ones that caused us this horrible headache of biochemistry with all these side branches. They did it in their head. And you know who the other guy was, uh, their buddies? Uh, Einstein. He was, he was with them. Uh, he, he, was a, like, he came to dinner once a week. So I, did, I read the history of Otto Warburg. Well, he got the Nobel Prize saying that the fermentation of sugar, that's the cause of cancer. Not the cause, that's how cancer thrives, by eating sugar. And if you take the sugar away and go to a ketogenic diet, they die. You live, they die. Same as COVID. Take the sugar away, you live, they die. Or you die, they live. What do you want to do? This, this question of sugar, and there's another person that you would love to read, uh, Thomas Seifert, or Seifert, S-E-Y-F-R-I-E-D, I believe it is. He's a PhD, but he's written a book and called The Metabolic Basis for Cancer. Mm -hmm. And he is adamant about this. And uh, I never spoke to him personally, but I, I always thought he was correct. And I have a lot of that stuff in the book. But back to sugar and why is it so bad? Uh, why? I mean, you, I get this question every day. Well, sugar is natural. Well, it's true. It is. Uh, are you familiar with a term called glycocalyx? Which, glycocalyx? Yeah. That's kind of a trendy new thing. It's been obviously around forever, but it's being talked about. So the glycocalyx, okay. let's go inside the artery and, and the endothelium. I don't know how much your audience wants me to go deep in that physiology. Hey, go, go, go deep, and then if anything needs clarification, we'll, we'll tell them. Okay, let's, let's start inside there. So yeah. the endothelium, which is the lining of a blood vessel, and... When sugar, and this, this is back to atherosclerosis, by the way. So the guy um, who coined that word, was, there was a couple of people, but primarily Verkal, again, 1800s. He was in um, Germany, and he looked at a vessel. He spoke five languages, by the way. He looked at a vessel, opened it up, and said, what is this gunk? Greek for gunk is athro, by the way. And hard, Makes sense. And hard, 
hardened gunk is atherosclerosis. How is that a diagnosis? It's not. It's an observation. What is this gunk? But I went yeah. back and I just actually reread his paper because I was, how do you think of that? I mean, this is 1860s. And cameras were just starting to come in. That's why that's, he, they could see it easier. And he could compare it because you could show a photograph to somebody else. Well, he actually had in his original paper that he thought inflammation was under the gunk. And, but he didn't know what the gunk, what the inflammation was being caused by, and that's sugar. So let's go to present day. Dr. Cook, head of the Metabolic Clinic at Stanford, Gerald Raven, I don't know if you know that name, but he's the one who coined the word syndrome X and insulin resistance. And he is the guy who figured all that out, and then Dr. Cook took over from him. So my first question to Dr. Cook, help me with this. this. <laughs> now, I had my opinion, so I didn't want to be thrown out of the place with the first question. So I said, Dr. Cook, could you help me with this cholesterol hypothesis? Oh, sure. What, what do you need to know? I said, I'm confused as to how that mechanism works. These are his words. I get to interview all these doctors, scientists, and cool people in this health and fitness industry, all made possible because of this podcast that is funded by the company I work for, which is Health Via Modern Nutrition, or HVMN. And it is not that they pay me to do this, but I genuinely love and believe in the product Ketone IQ. I use it every day before my podcast, before my workout, or even after my workout for recovery. There hasn't been a single supplement that can give me such a drastic change in subjective feel within minutes as much as Ketone IQ has. For those of you who do not know me, I'm from Malaysia, I got my PhD from the UK, and my passion is in science and chronic diseases, and I believe it is all about transparency, scientific integrity, and about sharing with everyone so that everyone can benefit from it. And if you like this content and our work, please do support us by liking, leaving a review, or sharing with your friends and families, or even buying a shot of Ketone IQ at any Sprouts nationwide in the US, and the first shot is on us. Just scan the QR code and you'll get your money back for your first shot. You can also use the code HVMNPOD20, that is H-V-M-N-P-O-D 20, and get 20% off your first purchase at the HVMN website. She so said the endothelium, we're back inside the order again, the endothelium is um, like Teflon, smooth. When you eat sugar, it makes the endothelium like Velcro. So you have a sticky surface. The signal goes out because there's a trauma to the liver to mobilize cholesterol to go to that area of inflammation and put down a coating to seal that off. That's like saying ambulances cause accidents. No, they don't. They respond to accidents. Sugar is the cause. So he agrees with that. That's what I thought, but that's how I got the answer out. Then we got into uh, Murad's work and the, and the um, ADMA and all that sort of thing. He's, he's just a brilliant guy, and he's right there in the forefront. So he taught me all that stuff, and that's, that's how I got into this um, chemistry of the, of the nerves and how it relates to all these different ailments, as we call them. So then I just said, well, wait a minute. If the, this nerve, the median nerve, innervates, meaning connects to this muscle, and this is its function. So then I went through all the nerves, and I go, okay, what are their function? What are their symptoms? Back to a clinical point. Let's, let's take autism. So what is, what is the nerve involved in autism? Or what is the symptom? The first symptom is del delayed speech. What muscles involved in speech? There are a lot of muscles, primarily the tongue. What nerve innervates the tongue? That would be called the hypoglossal, meaning under the tongue. <laughs> Twelfth cranial nerve. Now, we memorized those years ago, and, but never, never really understood what the hell they did. Hypoglossal nerve, where's the neuron? It's in the back of the neck in the called, a structure called the, the olive. What embryology? Uh, your, your background is PhD in? Physiology. 
and and feel, but yeah, specifically the metabolism uh, of of the cardiac uh, of the diabetic heart. Okay, I'll I'll spend a lot of time on that. I have a big interest because of Dr. Cook. So, I said to myself, okay, when does that neuron form? Embryology. Now you took embryology when you're a while. A while ago, right. yes. <laughs> and you plowed through it because that was not going to be your thing per se. And you know how difficult that is. It's all memorization. A lot of biology is memorization. That's, that's the problem. It's like you memorize the pathway, you memorize the intermediates, you memorize what turns into what by what enzymes. I know. Right? I mean, we all can, can, can really relate to that. So, Oh, it's just, it's just horrible. So... I'm asking myself this question. So um, I'm on the 12th cranial nerve. We got the hypoglossal. When did it form? Day 22 to day 24, the nu nucleus. So I'm looking for compression. So I find an article. I think it was around 2000 in Scientific America. They were written, it was written by embryologists. They were talking about thalidomide babies and compare it to um, autistic kids. Autistic kids, amazingly, they have, it's well done, but they're embryologists, not surgeons. And I mean that in terms of my training with Dr. Dellen, because now let me just go back to what I always say. I, I'm looking at this through Dellen's lens. When I do the surgery, I'm doing it under magnification. So there's an old expression, you know, the mind cannot perceive what the eye cannot see. <laughs> it's so true. I read his textbook, but what is he talking about? Put these lenses on. Now I'm looking at the nerve. Oh, my God, there's the dent. The dent from the sugar created. It's there. But I never saw that before because I didn't have his lens on and I did not have his knowledge. When you put the together, two together, it's, oh, my God. Now, who is doing most of the research in the, in the, the research? Basically, PhDs, right? Mm -hmm. Not surgeons. No. The old joke, what does this, when an uh, elevator door opens, how do you tell the difference between a medical doctor and a surgeon? Do you know the answer to that? Well, the, the surgeon sticks his head in the door because that's the least valuable thing he has. The medical doctor puts his hand in because he uses his brain, not his hands. That's the old joke. <laughs> Who's, who, how do you stop the door from closing, with your head or your hand? Well, it applies to this issue. So if you're, if you're a surgeon, you're looking for things mechanically and you're cutting things out, and you're looking at it, but you have Dellen's lens now. You take a look at this dent. Oh, my God, there it is. And you release that surgically, carpal tunnel, whatever nerve, and the blood supply starts again, the nerve amplitude starts, and the function comes back. It's that simple. It's kind of like yesterday with me without <laughs> the earphones. And then today, it all works. It all works. So, so let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about, you know, let's come full circle. We talked a lot about the decompression. We talked a lot, you know, we went into the details, the nitty gritty of disease progression of neuropathy. And you talked about decompression. What exactly is decompression? What is the protocol to reinstate the function of the nerves? Okay. So it's a surgical answer. So... There have to be criteria, of course. So let's take, I'll, in my field, diabetic neuropathy. So we have a patient, and I put them in five phases. That had never been done before. So we can have, what are we talking about? Phase one, change your diet, don't eat sugar, take some supplements, B vitamins. We didn't, let me cover that first before I get into the surgical, because it's not all surgical. It's probably more medical than it is surgical. So the first phase, get a little zinger to those formications. They come and they go. Go to your doctor. What are these little things? Of course, most doctors wouldn't know the answer to this because it's a very highly specialized neuropathy kind of. Most doctors, neurologists, are going to write 
Lyric or gabapentin or something like that. Don't worry about it. That'll take care of it. It does. It works in the brain. You won't feel that. I would say, on the other hand, it, I would do a test. I could do a little punch biopsy, see if they're losing uh, micro C fibers, and that's quantifiable. And I could do a dead blood test on ADMA, and if it's elevated and I have that plus that symptom, you probably have early stage small fiber neuropathy. That's how you make diagnosis. Let's look at your diet. Don't eat sugar. Oh, I'm not going to do that. Well, can you use supplements? Yes. So let's answer that question right now. So biochemistry. L-arginine converts to nitric oxide. ADMA blocks that conversion. That's not fully known yet because there's a hormone that regulates that. And then so they're still doing research on that, why that happens. But I think the answer is sugar. But there's a cofactor called tetrahydrobiopterin. Tetrahydro Are you familiar with that word? Uh, it's a cofactor in every cell. So when I was working with Dr. Cook, he introduced that concept to me. So the notation is BH4, by the way, if you're looking it up chemistry-wise. Well, but what is it? Well, it's the B vitamins, specifically B6, B12, and some people think B3. So we have B vitamins, folic acid, uh, and vitamin C, because you wanted me to talk about vitamin C. So let's talk about that guy. Have you ever heard of the um, ascorbate competition theory? Uh, no, I assume from the sound of it is competition with vitamin C. Yes. And you know how some of these words you never look up? And then one day I looked up um, ascorbate. Well, you know what ascorbate means? No scurvy in Latin. <laughs> and when you have lack of vitamin C or ascorbic acid, you get scurvy. You got it. But, you know, you use words like that, never look it up. And I went, oh. That's what it is. So the ascorbate competition theory means that vitamin C competes with glucose. So there are two carbons different. We, as humans, do not have the ability to make vitamin C, which I find rather amazing. Given how close they are, because we can make, you know, um, uh, from glucose, we can make many other things, right? We can go through the whole Krebs cycle, all the intermediates, take out all the carbons. It's amazing that we couldn't make vitamin C. That is a whole other subject. Someday I'm going to talk to you about that. So about 220,000 years ago, mass mutation, which I find also bizarre. And we as humans cannot do that. But we, we have the gene there, GLU1, I think it is, in chromosome 2. So something happened to chromosome 2. So we'll leave that for another day. But anyway, we can't do that. So we have vitamin C in BH4 to help convert L-arginine to nitric oxide. Okay? It's easier if I was doing a whiteboard. So the cofactor BH4, if your vitamin C levels are low, you're going to produce not nitric oxide. You're going to produce peroxynitrite. So what's the difference? Nitric oxide dilates the blood vessel. Peroxynitrite contracts the vessel. So now I go to the cofactor, and I think this is where it really the rubber meets the road with the sugar vitamin C thing. And I was amazed when I was doing this research, and then I looked at the literature, no one ever talks about that. So then I found another term that explains blood flow in hemodynamics, plus Wells theorem. I don't know if anybody, we're going to talk about the heart. We're going to go right to your subject in a second. Have you heard of plus Wells theorem? No. So and I'm probably not pronouncing it right because I never heard anybody ever use the word. <clears throat> but what it means is it's a complicated theorem of hemodynamics, a lot of variables, but the real important variable is the radius of the vessel. And the radius of the vessel is R to the fourth power. So I'm looking at that, and I'm like, wait a minute, R to the fourth power. So it roughly a 19% reduction in the radius equals 
a 50% reduction in flow. I had to read it like three times. Well, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. But the math behind, that's the theorem. Now, you have other cofounders, you know, the thickness of the blood, the laminar flow, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the major point out of that. So imagine that, 19% reduction. So you could have high levels of sugar knocking out the vitamin C, converting to peroxynitrate, just a small incremental loss, you're going to have a 50% reduction in flow. So let's go to your field, the heart, metabolic syndrome. I segued into that pretty good, didn't I? Yeah, you did. And, and don't forget, we're going to go back to the decompression still, because we only covered covering the first part, which is the nutrition, the medical oh, part. Oh, yeah. You know? Well, I can, put, I can put both in there. Yes. Okay, so, so let's go specifically to the tarsal tunnel, which is the posterior tibial nerve. It branches. Oh, this will be perfect for you. So it branches into the medial and lateral plantar nerve. They're, they have all, they have sensory, uh, autonomic, and motor fibers. And there's another third nerve just as sensory. So we're not going to talk about him for a second. So it innervates the plantar aspect of the foot. And there are a lot of muscles on the bottom of the foot. So that's where diabetic neuropathy is really challenging because you lose the sensation. The little receptors, the chemo or the uh, mechanical receptors, they all have names like Meisner and, 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 and what is the other one? Um, Merle. And there's a third one I forget at the moment. But anyway, you can measure them by various different measurements, but they're, they look like corkscrews under the skin. They're just little spirals. And they lose their sensitivity. And then you can't feel the ground. You get, a, you get uh, the, from the autonomic, the skin dries out, the pressures increase, redness starts to form, the chronic inflammation, callus forms, loss of feeling, get a little... Uh, malnourished under the callus, gets infected, gets into the bone, osteomyelitis, boom, 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 amputation. That's the cascade. So what does the del and decompression do? So we do a nerve conduction test, which means we're running electricity through the wire, and we're looking for a waveform, amplitude, and we want to test what the latency is to turn that using neurology, how long does it take the electric to go from point A to point B? Compression. So we're looking at the nerve. We want to know, is there a loss of amplitude, increased latency? So we know there's some compression somewhere along that nerve. Now, in surgery, I use a device called a NIM monitor, nerve integrity monitor. So it's really a small... Uh, nerve conduction. So I put one of the right. electrodes into this side of the foot, electrode on that muscle. Yep. They all have names, abductor, digit, quinty, and all that sort of thing. So I want to know which nerves innervating which muscle. And then when I open the tarsal tunnel, I'm looking with a probe and I'm measuring the amplitude. And I can hear it on a, a oscilloscope as well. I can see it. I can hear it. And I actually can feel it. And it, so I'm probing and say the little toe is not moving because that muscle is not working. Nerve, muscle, function. And then when I get, I follow the nerve down and I have loops on so I can see. And I can see these adhesions this, where the dent is forming. And I clean that off, put the probe on, amplitude goes up, it's, it's, and you can hear it. And the toe is going like this. If you can see this, it's gone like that. It's twitching. Never twitched before because it didn't function. So you take the pressure off the nerve and the electric flows. That's how it works. So I do all the nerves in the lower extremity, and that's, that's, what, is, that's what we do. That's, that's it physically, yes. So I'm looking at the nerve. I'm looking at the adhesions. I can feel... I can feel the different fats. When you do this, you know, like thousands, which I've done, I, it's almost like checking oil in a car. You know, this is bad oil. <laughs> it's, got, it's got too many 
omega-6 fatty acids because there's different feel to that over omega-3, and we'll get into that in a second. But I can feel that. I can see it. I can hear it, and I can record it. Whenever people hear decompression, most of the time when people use the word decompression is decompression of like concussion of like you know you you just physically decompress something but here is the action of decompressing the nerve via surgery that can essentially prevent amputation and and improve nervous uh nervous function so a lot of papers Dellen's done most of the papers i helped him in a couple um yeah, it works. It's not well accepted in medicine and surgery because we, we don't have that level one study in the New England Journal. We did the, the sham surgery where you do a fake surgery on one side, the real surgery on the other side. It's about 80% effective, depending what phase you're in. In phase one, we wouldn't do surgery. Phase two, phase three to four to five. Now, I didn't give the clinical signs. So when you tap on the nerve, if it tingles, that's called a tinel sign. And that means that the nerve is still alive. It's not conducting well, but it'll tingle. Like you take this wire and you get static. It's working. Now, if it had no static, well, it's not flowing at all. So that's a, that's a sign that Dr. Dellen likes to use. Tap on the nerve. If this tinel signs, it's salvageable. Second one is called a provocative sign, pressing on a nerve, and they have pain and pull away. So you know you have a viable nerve, a damaged nerve, but viable. The testing is confirmed what you did clinically. But if I'm lecturing to neurologists, which I do all the time, they look at me dumbfounded. Dumb, dumbfounded. Why? Because they don't have the lens. And even if they did, what would they do? They have a pen. They write for Lyrica. That's what they do. Come back in six months and we'll do another nerve conduction. What, what do you think is going to change? It's going to be worse. It has to be worse. So in the Dellen... So the different phases, different phases are severity levels. So that'll segue into, I'm going to keep you in the tarsal tunnel, and I'm going to go to the heart here in a second. We covered ADMA, sugar, vitamin C, scorbate, competition theory. So, yeah, talking about vitamin C, just to summarize what you said as well, having enough su vitamin C supplementation will then compete with glucose in order to prevent ADMA from inhibiting the conversion of L-arginine yes. um, to ADMA and therefore um, having enough nitrous oxide so that vasodilation can happen and therefore the compression can be prevented and neuropathy can be prevented. You're like one of my professors in biology. <laughs> Perfectly done. Perfectly done. <laughs> I mean, that's part of the job. It comes with the job. Right, because you're, you're logical. You want to see how things work. And, well, and a lot of times I, I tell people biology, metabolism is, is logical. That's why I like it, because you run it through your brain and just go through step by step and, and rationalize it. As long as these steps are proven and being studied on, it will make sense. And, and it doesn't need to, it's not quantum physics or, you know, where you have all these like different equations and all of that. That's why I like biology because it just, you know, you, you are like telling a story. There is a beginning, there's a middle, and there's the end. <laughs> I wish I had you in school. <laughs> um, yeah, the, it, it is logical. And, and that's how I came to this theory, because that nothing ever seemed logical to me. I was going, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense to me. That, that's a funny thing. The, back to the small fiber, large fiber, and I was saying to Dr. Dellen and, and, and there's another fellow, he's um, a neuroanatomist, and this is 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. And I'm saying, I don't understand what you guys are saying. Now, I know him well enough. We can talk like we're talking which you can't do in school. You know, they throw you out of class. So I said, this doesn't make sense to me. And they were, both of them were explaining to me. No, I said, no, I understand what you're saying. I just don't, I don't think it makes sense. Well, it didn't because it wasn't right. 
Even though it's, I mean, that was, you know, 25 years ago. You have to add little pieces of the puzzle, little pieces, and all of a sudden, it flows. There you go. I mean, it was, but, you know, no one took the time to do that. But I was trying to answer for myself because I didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to me. And all of a sudden, just the way you did it, it just flowed. Yeah, that makes yeah, and I love and I love scientists and doctors like yourself because, as you said, you take pieces of the puzzles and you put it together. And no matter how long it takes, fifteen years, twenty-five years, you change your views based on the new data. But a lot of scientists these days, because of their ego, if anything, and the years of work, they are going to live and die on that hill. They are not willing to change their views. If they think one thing is causing this disease, that's it. That's the end of the day. No matter what new data comes out, they are not going to budge. And I think that is the, the, the flaw of some scientists here because of their stubbornness, not based on realistic objective data, but rather based on ego and pride and not willing to share that information knowledge outside. That's a perfect, you, you described it so well. There's a fellow by the name of Shai Rosen at the University of Texas. He's out of Israel. He did the double-blind study on the Dell and decompression, basically to prove him wrong. But he proved him right, because that's what we're supposed to do. Poke holes in it, just like in any kind of science. You know, like in, especially in computer science, you want to see if you can get through the system. Where are the bugs? So... He did a great paper. It's never been published in, in the top journals like AMA or N New England Journal because the, the results were too good. No one, well, this is, this is crazy. It can't be that good. So it really hasn't been published. But I read the paper, and actually I was on a uh, podium with him. This is 10 years ago. And I, and I gave my theory, which I just gave you, and he's an animation surgeon. And I said, animation surgeon, do you work for Disney? <laughs> but he does facial nerves. So like Bell's palsy or strokes and we have asymmetric face. He can reroute the nerves to the muscles. I actually, I actually had Bell's palsy once. During my first year of my PhD, I was so stressed. I, I cycled to, to the lab on a Saturday. It was in the UK. It's really cold, and when you cycle in the cold, it's normal, your, your face goes numb, right? I go, went and fed my rats and weigh them and do the normal stuff that, you know, you talked about. And then half an hour later, half of my face was still numb, and I thought something was wrong. And I looked at the mirror, I was like, oh crap, I can't move half of my face. And I couldn't go to the doctors until Monday, because it was a weekend. Obviously, you know, I had to Google and everything, and everything came up to me having a stroke, you know. And, and then Monday came around, went to the doctor. The doctor was like, it's not a stroke, so don't worry. It's Bell's palsy. They gave me steroids for the week, and then it re recovered after. But that was a scary experience. Anyway, uh, sorry to cut you off. But, uh. Well, it is scary. No, no, it is scary. And uh, so there's a lot of nerves in the face, the facial nerve. That's Bell's palsy. Dr. Bell. Describe that, but you never describe what causes it. Now, it's, a lot of people think these are viruses. Stress certainly would be part of that. Sugar is part of it as well, by the way. Um, trigeminal neuralgia, that's another one. Um, so they all have names. So they sound like different diseases. They're not. They're all the same thing, different location. Now, you could have different anatomy. We didn't talk about epigenetics. I think that plays a big part. If you had the genes that express, you come in contact with the trigger, you're going to get the problem. So Dr. Rosen, he, I'm on a podium. I give my talk, and then he gave his talk. And he, said, he complimented. He thought it was a great theory. And I said, yeah, I think it applies to Bell's palsy and stuff. He said, oh, no, not that nerve. He actually said, not not my nerve, every other nerve, yes. And I've had that, because he built this big body of knowledge, and he's the super expert on that. I'm not the expert on that nerve, but I'm stepping, I, so I call it, I'm stepping on their nerves. <laughs> so like Alzheimer's, a big research 
place here in Phoenix. A cl perfect uh, segue to that. So I'm playing tennis, and the this guy that I was playing against, he was the he was chairman of the board of the local hospital, big, big hospital system. And somebody said, I wrote a book, Sugar. Oh, well, what's the book about? And we're playing tennis. I didn't really want to talk about it. But anyway, so I'm chairman of the board. I want to know about this book you wrote. And I told him, and, and I said, mentioned, you know, autism, um, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, we're the leading uh, center for uh, Alzheimer's in the world, Dr. Raman or whatever his name was. I want you to lecture to them. I said, I'd love to, but that's never going to happen. And he said, I'm the chairman of the board. I said, I know it'll happen because it's happened so many times. But he said, no, you call my office. I'll get you in there. Well, I called the office. He never got me in. Why? Because the grants that they get are looking for a drug to solve that problem. And it's millions, tens of millions. And I'm going to say, don't eat sugar. Well, give me 10 cents, you know. And I'm not in that field, so they couldn't hear what I was having to say. And I explained it to you in the beginning. It's just a nerve that gets inflamed, that gets cut off, and it causes that those symptoms that you that we all know. So I promised you I was going to go into the heart thing, and I think sugar is that problem. AFib is the biggest thing going on. And AFib is. You want to explain what AFib is to our audience? Oh, oh, atrial fibrillation. So. I don't know why. I, oh, I know. I had a patient <clears throat> a couple of years ago came in. And he had uh, diabetes, and he had a foot drop. That nerve is the common peroneal nerve on the outside of the leg. Fairly common in diabetics, and so, and he wasn't in good health. In his, so I said, I'm going to send you over for a workup, cardiology. Oh, you're in. You have a right bundle branch block, and I went, wow. Okay, I haven't looked at that or heard that because that's not my field. And I went, wow, right bundle branch block, diabetic, there's another nerve. So I did a deep dive on that, down to the bundle of hiss. That's probably where you live, right? The bundle the of bundle. hiss down in there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> haven't had that for a <laughs> did while. Did you know? Yeah. Did you know he was, he, he was from London? He was, that's, his, that's a guy's name, Sir Hiss. Yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. Anyway, HIS, that's his name. And that node between the um, left and right atriums. So there, there's, the, there's, I'll ask you this question because I couldn't find the answer. The nerve goes through the septum, but they don't name that as a tunnel. And it branches to the right and left branch. Well, the tarsal tunnel. Medial and lateral divisions. That's what nerves do. They divide and divide and divide. That division. I, so I looked up the article. And I'll pass this on to you. I, saw, I thought to myself, I wonder if ADMA are elevated in that problem. Yes, they are. Quite high. Wow. That was number one. So I called Dr. Cook and I told him that uh, he's doing stem cells now. So he wasn't real interested in that. But I went to Dr. Dellen and I said, look at, look at this. It looks exactly like the tarsal tunnel division. If you didn't know the difference, you looked under a microscope, you couldn't tell the nerve in the ankle and the nerve in the, in the heart. And I said, the ADMA, is, I said, I think that's the first area of compression by the biochemistry that you taught me. <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, he wasn't too interested in it. But I'm going to give that to you to look at. Because it hasn't been solved and it's quite prevalent. Yeah. Because, you know, we see, we look at atherosclerosis, we look at, you know, cholesterol intake, we look at um, difference in ions, you know, that causes arrhythmia and all of this. But I don't remember seeing any papers that is looking specifically on ADMA. I mean, in fact, today is my first time hearing it from you. So that's super interesting. Um, and I think back to, I wanted to make a point as well, back to what you were saying about Alzheimer's on how the grants are paying millions of dollars to use drugs to solve this problem. And instead, 
you could potentially improve or elevate the Alzheimer's disease by cutting out sugar or even taking in ketones. In fact, right now there's an NIH study that is using exogenous ketones to look at dementia and Alzheimer's. And I'm currently talking to a potential collaborator to look at um, fragile X syndrome and all these different neurological um, disorders to use exogenous ketone to, to solve it. So that's super interesting area that is coming up. And if it really works and we publish it, it's going to be shaking the world of, of, of medicine, um, especially within the pharma world where they already spend millions and billions of dollars to develop these drugs and go through these regulatory processes. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a super interesting conversation and, and I know we are here we are already over time and you know the the, uh, the audience are just going to get this bonus um time that that they're going to get every week because of the wealth of knowledge and expertise that you have and and to round it all up i'm going to you know throw a zinger at, at this conversation i'm going to agree and contradict dr jacoby at the same time here because we are we talked a lot about how sugar causes inflammation and Dr. Jacoby described very beautifully on how this is so, how does the sugar actually increase inflammation and how does that lead to neuropathy, the, the disease of neurons and nervous system. And this has been really enlightening for me. But I have to add that the caveat to this discussion and this explanation is the access of sugar. It is sugar, not sugar in and of itself as a substrate in and of itself is a great substrate and our body needs sugar. Even when we cut out sugar, we have a baseline blood glucose level because our body needs sugar to function. But what we just discussed for the past hour and 15 minutes here is essentially the access of sugar to the point where your body is not able to regulate normal blood glucose regulation, where your insulin, your pancreatic beta cell, have failed to keep your blood glucose within the level. As we were talking before, metabolism is never a straight line. It's often, most often than not, in a wave form where we need to keep it within the optimal level. And what is happening when you do not keep your blood glucose within the optimal level, this is what happens. It, it creates an environment where dysfunction piles onto another dysfunction, piles onto another dysfunction, and eventually manifests itself into diseases and symptoms that most of the time, the current healthcare and medicine would just look at it from a symptom point, point of view and therefore solve the symptoms and not necessarily the root cause. Um, and this is why we are doing what we're doing Dr. Jacoby, myself, HVMM Podcast, is really to spread the awareness and spread the knowledge around the mechanism of action of disease progression, disease manifestation, and most importantly, the root cause, which could very well be lifestyle and diet driven and can also simply be solved by changing and modifying lifestyle and your diet. Well said. Um, I was at a med tech convention last week. By the way, where, where are you based now? I'm based in San Francisco. Okay, this was in Newport Beach. And it was melding um, technology with uh, the chemistry. Actually, you mentioned quantum physics. You said it's not quantum physics. So my, it was about wearables, measuring the quantum foam of biology. That was my lecture. Getting down into the nanoparticles, uh, and looking at that, and there's a lot of devices. There is a cool pair of glasses that takes a camera of your eyes at 130 diseases, records it. And these are people that would not know they had any eye disease. Uh, there's a watch uh, glucose monitor that uses optics rather than invasive uh, things like that. But there was a whole bunch of companies. So we will solve that non-pharmacologically. Uh, but they'll go kicking and screaming, I'm sure, because this is solving the problem, not putting a Band-Aid on, but not monetizing yep. the problem, as I like to say. Um, I didn't mention the sugar. I'll just finish with this, the sugar. So It's so fundamental. In England, where you, you're from, they, the, 
in the 1600s, sugar was $1,000 a pound. That's where all this, this started. You know, the English, they, they, they're like museum. They started everything, it seems. But Thomas Wills, the first neurologist, he named, you know, Circle Wills. And Hiss in the heart, a lot of English-speaking uh, uh, guys from London. But they were observing the effects of sugar because it was flooding into London. The rich had sugar because it's so expensive. They had doctors, so they named the diseases. The poor just died from, you know, infectious diseases or malnutrition. But the rich ate sugar. That's so, but what is sugar? Sugar is a, bi a disaccharide. And I think this is the biggest trick of all times. Sugar, fructose, and glucose. Glucose is a poison. Can't, can't metabolize anything more than one teaspoon of glucose at any one time because you'll spike your insulin. But fructose does not spike your insulin. It works through a different mechanism. When I went to school, hey, sugar is sugar is sugar. No, they're not chemically different. So we have sucrose, table sugar. We love it because it's sweet. Glucose is not sweet. So we overeat the sweetness, the fructose, and the FDA said, well, it's not spiking your insulin, but you're eating all that glucose along with it, which is spiking your insulin. And the insulin is the only molecule that can store fat. And that's the trick. So we over, and leptin is turned off when you eat fructose. So there's all those pathways in ghrelin, and that's, that's a, for another discussion. But it's all interrelated. And leptin, just, just to clarify, leptin is the hormone that makes you feel full, the satiety hormone. And ghrelin makes you feel hungry, just to clarify. So, so, so glucose, sucrose, fructose. And you said sucrose, you know, is the sweet one and the fructose. So what's this big deal? Because a lot of people, you know, on social media and, and, and in general in the world were talking, you know, avoid high fructose corn syrup because they're unhealthy, right? But then you're saying fructose. So what's the difference between those fructose and, and the fructose that you talked about? Well, fruit, there's a good book out, uh, Richard Johnson, um, Nature Wants to Make You Fat, I think it's called. Boiling it down, he's talking about fructose. Yes, that's, you climb out of the cave 100,000 years ago, and you're skinny, you've lost all your fat, like a bear hibernating. You go eat fruit. That's what you want. That's what you need. You need to eat that in abundance to put a lot of fat back on your body. So if you want to be fat, eat fruit. If you want to be skinny, eat fat. Real simple. But, that sugar from fructose is only available in the Northern Hemisphere probably six weeks, right? It's not available, but Safeway is available every day. And that's what people do. They eat fruit all day. Oh, I'm eating healthy. I eat my fruits and vegetables. No, you're eating sugar all day. In the form of fructose, it, spikes, it doesn't spike your insulin, but it brings in the glucose along with it, which does, and you store it as fat. It's that simple. Got it. But it does taste good. It does. It does. <laughs> and, and, and just to clarify as well, you know, fructose and sucrose, eventually, they, going through the digestive system, they, does bro they do broke down to glucose, and that's what Dr. Jacoby was uh, explaining. And um, in terms of tips and advice for our audience, right, one last thing. Tips and advice, so, um, yeah. I think the best thing is reading a label, Total number of carbohydrates divide by four. Like if it's 16 and yogurt, four into 16, that's four, that's four teaspoons. Would you put four teaspoons of sugar in a small little yogurt thing? The answer is no. That's more sugar than a candy bar. If you really want the sugar, eat the candy bar. Don't torture yourself and pretend you're eating healthy, which you're not. What about, what about complex carbs? Like if people want to eat potatoes and rice, well, they, they, the glycemic index is important. The slower that it uh, absorbs, it doesn't spike your sugars, your glucose levels as high, but they're still carbohydrates. And most 
And most of the things we eat are not complex. Maybe the bark of the tree is complex. <laughs> yeah. So, so moderately, um, and you know, use sugar moderately. And, and if you're an active person, if you're an athlete and you really will burn all those sugar, then obviously have that as part of your diet. But if you are living mainly a sedentary lifestyle, then be wary of how much sugar you're actually eating and therefore storing in as fat. Um, most recently, I am obsessed with the source of carb, which is lotus roots. Not many people know about this because it's a very Asian centric um, food. It's, it's basically lotus What's it called? Lotus roots. Ooh, okay. it's, it's I don't know. high fiber, high carbs, but very low glycemic index. Um, and uh, that has been my, my sort of go-to carb uh, source at the moment. So check it out um, for those who, you know, just go and stir fry it or whatever. Well, we could, we could have a whole other discussion of foods, different sugars. Um, we didn't talk about stem cells. That's, all, that's, that's the nature of my new book. Unglued, and we'll we'll get into it. We have to come. We have to come for for um, part two of this episode. So, lastly, how can our audience find you? Find your book, Sugar Crush. Uh, please share with our audience. Sugar Crush, Barnes and Noble, Amazon for sure. Um, me personally, my website, Extremity Health Center. That's my office. Um, that probably the best way. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacoby. And um, it has been a delightful conversation. I've learned a lot. Um, so thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Well, thank you for having me on. It was fun. <laughs>